thank you all for coming uh, tonight. And uh, okay, so anyways, welcome to Skylight. If you haven't been here before, um, uh, if you have a group of buyer um, membership, you can also buy books through us online. Um, our membership offers 10% off on all books and 20% off on all the best sellers. Um, and now, if you could, um, if anybody has cell phones on, be sure to uh, turn them off or um, put them all the way down to the lowest volume. Um, one more uh, announcement is that um, for upcoming events, uh, just like tonight, we often have many events going on. On Saturday, on Saturday uh, tomorrow night, we have a, 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 a launch party um, for issue two of the collective transmedia LA-based Dean Sundar, um, and we'll be featuring DJ Spinning, reading live music, a projected film, food and drinks. Thank you. Well, the mic here, let's get On Sunday, uh, November 20th, uh, we're going to have readings from the new issue of Makeshift Magazine. And now without further ado, um, here to introduce tonight's readers, joining us from the University of Southern California's Master of Professional Writing Program, along with Steve Field, is Mary to our final uh, Master of Professional Writing faculty and student reading series event of the fall semester. Um, our theme tonight is Gluttony and Temperance in Keeping with the Month. And our special faculty reader will be a plain screenwriting guru, Sid Field. <laughs> so I'm Mary, the student coordinator of the reading series. Um, I'd like to thank Skylight for their continued support of our program and our events and Mary and Laura for helping organize the night. Um, and thank you to Picas for filming the evening for our MPW YouTube page. Um, so, in honor of our theme for this evening, I always try to find a somewhat humorous quote, but um, surprisingly there weren't any about temperance. Um, but there was a quote by Michael Dresser who said, Thanksgiving is America's national chow down feast, the one occasion each year when gluttony becomes a patriotic duty. <laughs> So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first reader of the evening. Uh, Farrington Smith C. Tatchett is in her first year debating between a fiction and a nonfiction concentration. Despite her belief that if something makes you really guilty, then it's not really pleasurable, Farrington's guiltiest pleasure is probably donuts. After looking up the seven sins and virtues, she decided her favorite virtue would be charity, because Wikipedia says it's like generosity, which she feels would solve the heat of the world's ills. And if Barrington could eat only one thing for the rest of her life, it would probably be veggie and bean burritos because they contain all the necessary food groups, especially if they have avocado. And you can carry them around with you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Barrington Smith's he tapped it. with the microphone like I was supposed to before everything started because it feels weird to do it. But Paul will be honest. Is this is this good? Am I hearable? Okay. Um, the book I'm reading from is a little lit journal from Indiana called Sycamore Review. Um, they were kind enough to put this in, uh, in their issue. Uh, it's a couple years old. Uh, that I thought it may be related a little bit to what me. Um, it's called My Hand Up. Items in my house have started singing. They have the voices of those children who ceaselessly encant when they want candy in a checkout line. Please, can I have it, please? Please, can I have it, please? Thus, the objects in my house. The dishes play an endless game of tag, moving themselves from surface to surface. Look at me, I'm on the table, I'm on the floor, I'm in the sink. You can't catch me, you can't wash me, you can't keep me in the cabinet. The papers, too, rise from their piles and fly about the room in love with the sound of their own voices. 
la 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 They sing so high pitched that the neighbor's dog will sometimes start to bark. I have tried to explain to my giant panda how I am reaching a breaking point, but it's hard for him to understand. He can't hear the plaintive wailing of the stiff socks underneath his favorite chair. This is not his fault. Because of his inefficient intestinal tract, he has to eat between 30 and 40 pounds of bamboo every day, which takes between 12 and 16 hours of constant eating. So it is not surprising he cannot hear the la 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 of the utility bills over the crunch crunch of bamboo splintering between his jaws. The noise must be deafening inside his head because it is loud even to my ears. Chomp, chomps punctuated by percussive cracks enter the singing la 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 chorus and I have to run from the house. Fortunately, there's always reason to leave as I must go to the store often in order to purchase more bamboo. There are as many as 42 varieties of bamboo that a giant panda can eat. Of these, my panda prefers arrow bamboo, bazetti bamboo, and black bamboo. When, due to limited availability, I must bring home another variety, such as hedge bamboo or yellow grove bamboo, my panda sometimes looks at me with sad eyes and sighs. I almost resent his inability to broaden his tastes. But then he is good, and he tells me that it's OK. He knows I tried, and, tells me, and thanks me for bringing him the bamboo. And he asks if I wouldn't mind chopping it up and putting it on a fresh plate for him, if I'm getting something for myself anyway. On the weekends, my panda likes to go to restaurants. Even more than his favorite type of bamboo, he likes to eat fresh bamboo shoots. Bamboo shoots, however, are not as filling as full-grown bamboo, so he must take in more than double the weight he would normally eat. It is not often that even a large Asian restaurant has 84 pounds of bamboo shoots. So we spend many Saturdays driving from restaurant to restaurant, waiting for tables, waiting to order, waiting for food. My panda enjoys this very much and thinks that it is a great treat for me as well, although I only eat at one or two of the restaurants. He likes to spend quality time together. I don't have the heart to tell him I would rather cook at home and have the remaining nine hours for myself, although I do appreciate how at the restaurants the tableware is well behaved and doesn't sing. Last Saturday, my panda was chewing his bamboo shoots inside the super happy china buffet, and I was smoking a cigarette across the street when a bus pulled up. Oh, I was smoking a cigarette in the parking lot when a bus pulled up at the station across the street. I decided to get on. It was an abrupt thought, but suddenly it seemed simple and possible. I would get on a bus. I would move to a new apartment where the cutlery was quiet and the walls didn't shake with constant crunching. I walked halfway across the street to the station when I remembered that my panda, having no pockets, had put his keys in my purse. <laughs> I couldn't leave him stranded, so I went back intending to give the keys to the hostess. But Super Happy China Buffet is a very large restaurant, and the hostess was young and worried she wouldn't know to which panda to give the keys. So she insisted I point him out. I raised my arm to show her. But when I saw my panda sitting alone at the table in our regular booth, waiting so patiently, looking with such hope, at the steamer tray where the bamboo shoots might soon be refilled. When I saw how he was chewing with his mouth closed, as I so often urged him to do at restaurants, <laughs> I told the hostess not to bother. I put the keys back in my purse and returned to my seat at the table, where my panda was very happy to see me. Josh Jackson. Josh is a
in his first year, nonfiction concentration. He takes pride in all his pleasures, except cheese, which does make him feel ashamed. <laughs> Gluttony is his favorite sin by birth. He is, after all, an American. If Josh could eat only one thing for the rest of his life, it would be peanut butter. You may not know that Josh's life is a never-ending struggle between behaving relatively acceptably and locking himself in a closet with Ken Burns documentaries and a bucket of pudding. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Josh Jackson. Um, so thank you, Nairi, and I want to thank you, uh, Skylight Books, for having us here tonight. And um, Andrea, and that's great. That was a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to read a chunk of an essay and kind of stop abruptly. Um, Ella and I plopped down in the only two seats together, all the way in the back of the bus and right next to the toilet. A man, 20-something, about our age, ordinary enough, was in the seat next to us by the window. He was on the phone, and I hoped he wouldn't be chatting the whole time. Ella had only arrived in Philly that morning, in time to meet me, Bill, and the Fizz for a Sunday doubleheader at Citizens Bank Park. There's no way of knowing how much I'd had to drink the night before, which I'd spent with Bill and the Fizz in the Fizz's University City apartment. Plus, the hours of sitting in the sunshine with junk food and beer had left me with a headache. As always, by the end of these weekends away from Ella, I was exhausted by the version of myself that had emerged relieved to be next to her, even by the bathroom on a crowded bus. Before the ride home to New York started, we retreated into her iPod with two sets of headphones. We held hands and I slipped into darkness, forgetting the itchy blue and yellow seats and the dim fluorescent light, and forgiving myself for the weekend. I briefly opened my eyes when I heard the man next to me hang up his phone and chug down the contents of his water bottle in one long pull, but I paid no mind. Then. The man curled over toward me, his head butting my arm once as he rummaged around in his pants side pocket. I looked over to give him a cue, hey, this is a cramped space and you're being a little inconsiderate, but he looked down. On the other side, Ella's head rested on my shoulder, her black hair matted against my blue t-shirt, and I tried not to disturb her while I kept my gaze on my neighbor, until his head snapped up and he stared at the seat in front of me. Whoa, where are we? he said. I looked out the window. We barely crossed the bridge and were in Camden or Cherry Hill or some such place, where shopping plazas lined the roadside just off the turnpike. I took an earbud out. What? I said, making an effort now not to look at him at all. I'm lost. Lost? Yeah. Where are we? East side? West side? I sensed he was playing some game with me, riddling me, but I wouldn't have known how to play along even if I wanted to. I remembered the time my stepfather took my brother and I canoeing in Moosehead Lake and a sleeping man in another canoe woke just as we passed. Where am I? He'd said. He was clearly looking for information about what part of the lake he drifted into, but my stepdad just answered, you're in a canoe. I put my earbud back in and faced straight ahead. You're on a bus, I said. <laughs> you're on a bus to New York or somewhere on the New Jersey turnpike. He stared at me. Oh. He said, disappointed. This is not a rhetorical question. What is with Philadelphia? During one of these visits, a year and a half earlier, Bill and I had swallowed down an entire bottle of Johnny Walker on the bus out of Manhattan. The Fizz met us on the street on the other end and led us around town. Hours later, we were waiting for SEPTA to bring us to the Fizz's apartment when a man, wiry, thin, in his sixties at least, appeared out of nowhere and instantly we were a foursome forming a square on the platform. He wore glasses, a white goatee, and a Marine Corps hat. He held his wallet at eye level, showing his driver's license. What's my name? He shouted. I squinted in at it. Eugene, I said. What's my name? He shouted. Eugene Dallas Gay, the fish shouted. He handed, each of a, he, he handed each of us a different and mismatching racial epithet and raved about our alleged perception that he had a dick in his ass. We tried to take him seriously, drunkenly tried to reason with him, until he ultimately would have no more. I took a contract out on your life, he said, looking from one of us to the next, and then considering the three of us together. I'm going to kill you with a 22 Magnum. Please don't, Bill said. <laughs> to everybody else on the platform, there was no difference between Eugene Dallas Gay and us. We were all part of the same spectacle. 
Ella had, of course, noticed the lost crackpot when he started talking to me, and she gave me a concerned look and whispered, What's going on? I could only shake my head and give her a look that meant, It's fine, but this guy's crazy. She looked back at me with a face that said, Are you sure? I shrugged, and we sat there trying to ignore the tension. We'd been dating for three years and living together for ten months, but this was a new situation. I would shift in my seat, and she'd mouth, You okay? The guy would shift in his seat, and I'd try to pick nothing up. This went on for 15 minutes or so. At which point, the guy, the guy climbed over me and stumbled by Ella's legs into the aisle. A woman from the middle of the bus passed him and went into the bathroom. The man strode forward and sat down in her seat. He talked to a short guy sitting next to him, and I was glad that he had a friend on the bus, somebody who could help orient him or keep him busy. He came over and asked me if I had his wallet, the small guy would later volunteer to a New Jersey State Police officer. When the woman came out of the bathroom and returned to her row, my neighbor immediately got up and came back to his seat next to me. He'd not been seated a full minute when he shouted, Wake up! His voice quivered with rage, and while I once again purposely avoided looking in his direction, I saw out of the corner of my eye that he'd made his demand to the bus's ceiling. But he'd been talking to nobody in particular, and so nobody responded. I felt him look at me. What are you listening to? I made a big show of, of my exasperation when I took my earbud out. What? What are you listening to? It's just music. I, uh, I don't want to... I really like that band. He muttered something indecipherable. Who? I said, then remembering myself. Look, I'm not really in the mood to talk. Yeah, they're really good. I don't want to talk, okay? He rifled through a knapsack at his feet and pulled out his cell phone. He pointed, at it. he pointed it at me. Can you say that again? Say you don't want to talk to me? I ignored him. A psychopath had recently decapitated another passenger aboard a Greyhound in Canada. I considered the possibility, remote I admit, since he was presumably in custody, but still a possibility that this was that same man with the head. <laughs> Ella, too, seemed to be thinking morbid thoughts. Her blue-green eyes narrowed and darkened. I couldn't help but think of how bright those eyes were just a few hours earlier, when she found the veggie dogs at the village park, and how if the guy did decapitate me, I wouldn't see them that bright again. We could have been at home, washing dishes together and bitching about the coming work week, or even after a dinner, after dinner at a Park Slope Bistro, boarding the B-65, a different bus, and a transportation mode I'd never before romanticized. If only I hadn't come to Philadelphia. The lunatic put his head against the window and made small noises of desperation, like a puppy. They became quieter and less frequent. I took that as a good sign, until he whipped his head toward me and yelled loudly enough for everybody aboard to hear, This bus ride sucks! I don't know what's going on with you, I said, but you need to behave yourself. He may not have heard my voice tremble, or how scared and angry I was. Maybe that's all he heard. I turned forward and resolved to ignore him for the rest of the ride, come what may. Ella whispered, are you okay? I nodded, an obvious lie. Do you know about the big project the German engineer is doing in New York? He said. I tried not to roll my eyes, tried not to do anything at all. You're a, Ger you're a German engineer, aren't you? He asked. He looked out the window and tapped on the glass. Pew! He said. He repeated the sound a few times. He grabbed the headrest of the seat in front of him and used it to pull himself up into a standing position. Hey! he said to the woman in the seat. She ignored him. He sat back down. He very slowly raised his right hand into the air and very quickly brought it down onto my right leg, establishing a tight grip on my knee. <laughs> enjoys serial BBC adaptations of great literary works or biopics of great literary figures. Sloth and lust are his specialty. He doesn't like virtues. <laughs> if Michael could eat one thing for the rest of his life, he'd eat nothing. I wish I thought of that. <laughs> and you may not know, Michael hasn't always been a man. Michael Duplessis, Michael Duplessis ladies and gentlemen. This is all fairly new work that I've been working on this semester. Am I, am I a little? Yeah, thanks. Um, 
the first poem I'm reading is a translation and adaptation from the French of Paul Verlaine's Colonne Sentimental from his collection Fête de Long. And it's, it, it reads as follows. Sentimental heart to heart. In a gutted industrial park, deserted and alone, two forms stumbled past, hesitated, then were gone. Their lips were livid, their eyes were dead, and no one living heard what words they said. In the abandoned industrial park, gutted all alone, two zombies still carried on about the times long gone. My love, do you not still burn with the blisses that we knew? Excuse me, sir, why does that matter at all to you? Your heart, does it still hang between her lust and hope at the mention of my name? Still you dream of me? No? Ah, gorgeous, fulgent days of joys unspeakable, when lips be locked. That's so probable. How bright the sky was, how free the market, and hope, how high. Hope went where the market went, and love too, into the darkened sky. And thus they staggered through the park, gutted, abandoned, dead, and only night paid attention to the words they said. The next poem is called The Sex Life of the Market, and it contains a found, a verbal found object, which I'm sure you'll be able to identify. It's in two parts. One, he was dressed like someone who was buying instead of selling, but perhaps he was a seller, dressed as a buyer, so that any buyers would be reassured by the flattering image he gave back of themselves, but perhaps he really was a buyer, dressed more like a seller, for reasons of private fantasy, that he could still really be a seller if he chose. Two, do you want to live a life devoid of dignity or inhibition, numbed to shame? Are you willing to suffer so that others may live in pampered comfort while you live off scraps and are routinely restrained, probed, slapped, choked, spit on, and subject to painful discipline? If this is you, get in touch. <laughs> Really the final object. Dead air. Ghost one to ghost two. You're back again? Ghost two to ghost one. Come here often? Ghost one to ghost two. Nothing else to do. Ghost two to ghost one. In spirit two. Ghost one to ghost two. You're so bright, you. <laughs> Sexy. It sounds creepy when you say it like that. Not anyone's idea of sexy, but you, baby, have the deadest eyes I have ever seen my skeleton in. Mementos mori, leather puff ball skirts, this is the only place to get killed in. <laughs> Couplet. Oh, there you are. You're always appearing behind me. I am. I do. And I'm very thrilled to be reading here tonight. I was telling Sid that I have such a long history with this, with this neighborhood that I remember when this was the bookstore called Chatterton's and across the way was a used German bookstore. This is a very long time ago. It means a lot to me. Reading at this East Hollywood institution. The next three poems all take place in a different East Hollywood institution. The first one is The Eagle, Midnight. Regard the sky. I sighed, East Hollywood half moon, such tristesse de la lune. You gushed, Planet of the Apes is great. And let a pushy pusher, buffoon, provocateur, consume our night. The next one is called As Real as It Gets Around Here. I cannot tolerate banal music, you said. And then you said, There's something I've forgotten to tell you, but now I can't remember what it is. And then the shirtless guy. Daniel was next, a really boring dude with a tattoo of Daniel in the lion's den. I am not making this up because his name was Daniel, he said. And he also had a two of the prodigal son, a story he'd always liked, he said. And you were cruising him, but then you said, let's go. And I had another beer, which was an issue. <laughs> the next one is Sebastian. He has a fashionably twirled moustache, and when Joe introduces him to me, I say, beautiful name. And he says, yeah, 
like the saint, and lifts his arms above his head in an appealing bondage pose, and I see he has agreeably hairy armpits. But it's very clear to me that he has eyes only for Joe, since he says to Joe, who's cute and short as opposed to cadaverous and tall, like certain first person narrators, are you Italian? And Joe says, no, Mexican. And he says, he's very Cuban from New York. And then they talk about New York. And after that, they both say that they're, they're the same height. Only Joe says he's shorter since he's wearing heels. And Sebastian says, so am I. And he heals Joe up. And it's clear Sebastian wants to get with himself in a mirror. And then I hear him say, that, yeah, he's had a portrait painted of himself as Saint Sebastian before, as he says it, all of this goes to hell, and he gestures down his body with a wiggle. And I say, why do you think the first person narrator is standing around talking about a saint with a guy who obviously just wants to get off? Won't it be very Dorian Gray? I mean, the picture could get old, not you. And he says, I wish, and the picture's so big, he gestures a miniature in the oils, and I consider telling him that the connection here is that Oscar Wilde called himself Sebastian Melmoth, after he came out of prison, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and this is separate from that, this is my last poem that you can be patient. Um, all four the hook. Before I knew what flames were for, the roses felt like glass. Why can't the wine glass hold its liquor or its tongue? The roses made a secret deal with beetles. Fuck ups at your fingertips like an obese angel with a scourge of stone. Frost, summer, wind, no one listens. The wine glass is your monument. Brush it with a finger and it goes to pieces. Why won't the wine glass hold its own? Bryce is in his first year of fiction concentration. His guiltiest pleasure is reading celebrity gossip. We won't talk about it. Uh, Bryce's favorite sin is gluttony, thanks to a slightly out of control addiction he has to eat every day. <laughs> if Bryce could eat only one thing for the rest of his life, it would be beer. And you may not know that Bryce's day job currently is in patent prote protection as a research analyst. Ladies and gentlemen, Bryce Glenn. in a shop, please. Whiskey. Uh, whatever we you got. Uh, thank you. Hey, to you, Brian. How are you tonight? I would agree that you are certainly mighty fine. Are you often? Well, I suppose if you did, then I'd have seen you before. I remember seeing a girl like you. What's your name, doll? That's a very pretty name. Me and the ex considered na naming our daughter that, but we much more that our mind for the name to take Sandra instead. You got a pretty last name, though, that pretty first name? Yeah, I suppose that's none of my business. You don't have to tell me twice. Old Earth here is nothing if not a gentleman. What you drinking? You look like a Cosmo girl to me. Sal, Cosmo for the lady, please? No? It's really my pleasure. If you insist, never mind Sal, the lady would like to pay for her own drink. Appletini? That would have been my second guess for you. That's a very classy drink. <laughs> the last girl who got Appletini's in here would be squeezing her tits. Something for you to think about. Hey, hey, no need to yell. No need to yell. It's just, I'm just messing with, with you, kiddo. I told you, I'm a gentleman. Uh, you've got a nice pair, but I'm, not, I'm all about getting permission. <laughs> Look at my hands, I'm keeping them to myself. It's just a rhyme. My cousin Scooter used to use that one at Ringo's Pub across town. Dollar Jello shop nights were easy pickings. He'd get a few slaps in the face, all right, but he'd also usually find at least one floozy drunk enough to let him do it. Did I ever tell you about Scooter? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess you're right. I wouldn't have been able to tell you about Scooter if I'd never seen him before. Scooter was a very fat man, probably an easy 500 pounds or so. His chin was a big old pouch like them bullfrogs we used to catch when we were kids. You don't look like the kind of lady that's ever caught a bullfrog. It's a compliment. Anyway. <laughs> 
Last <laughs> <laughs> year, Crunk Dad septic by day, but on weekends he was the best construction derby racer in the whole county. He could barely squeeze into the beater cars, but that blow was a wrecking ball once he got behind the wheel. I once see him tee on North Plymouth and he damn near split that car in two. Scooter just kept going, he supposed one of them speed bumps they got in the city. After a while, it wasn't even a destruction derby anymore. It's just Scooter chasing the other drivers around the track while they try to get the heck out of there. I love the racetrack. Five bucks and you get in, you can bring a 12 pack and just sit back and drink and watch the carnage. It's a hoot. I'll take you out there one of these days. Well, we'll see about that. Anyway, that's not the whole Scooter story. So one day he starts getting all tired. He can't even make it over the Burger King for lunch. Dr. Tone tells him he's got the diabetes. Scooter doesn't care, though. He's a wrecking ball, he tells the doc. He ain't going to be stopped by no diabetes. <laughs> well, that didn't last very long. Pretty soon he's back at the doc's office. Something's up with the foot, Scoot. Gonna have to chop it. I shit you not. So they cut the leg off without mid shin. Now, septic and derby racing, even if you're best in the county, you don't pay much. Scoot can't afford one of those fancy titanium legs. So we get our friend Patsy to make him a wooden thing. Yeah, peg leg. Scooter would huff around on the peg like a goddamn madman. You could see the younger kids hide away when they heard the thing clanking against the sidewalk. But the older kids, they'd come around when they heard the leg just to see the fattest damn pirate that ever hopped in there. I knew they wanted to poke out one of Scoot's eyes to finish the book. Now, let me tell you, the son of a bitch still did derby racing. He hung a pirate flag from the antenna of his car and he'd tear that track up like it wasn't nobody's business. Jolly Roger, you say? I ain't never heard of that, but I'll take your word for it. Sal, another beer and whiskey, please. Better make the whiskey double. Let me get your next apple tea, darling. No? That's all right. I like a girl to pace for a room way. Just don't ever say that chivalry's dead. If I ever catch you saying that, I'll pop you right on your nose. <laughs> Honey, don't leave. I'm just talking out my ass. I never harm you, I promise. Just sit, sit back down and stay a little while. I ain't even done with the scooter story. Thank you. So, one night, Scooter is at the track and the dirt starts, and he heads out in the middle to do some donuts and show off a bit to get the crowd riled up. None of the other drivers go after each other. Instead, they all head straight for Scooter. They just pound him from all sides, and Scooter can't find a way out. He starts leaking gas. Now, usually the other cars stop at this point and let the driver leave the track, but these guys just kept slamming and slamming him until the fire starts. Once it hits the, once it hits the gas, Scooter goes up in flames. He can't crawl out the window or roll around or nothing. So he just incinerates. Everybody was so quiet you could hear him screaming from the parking lot. I was a bit surprised that the other guys didn't get out of the race marshmallows ever. It is horrifying indeed. Poor Scoot didn't have a chance. But, as rumor has it, after a couple weeks, the other drivers started seeing Scoot's car on the road. Power flag and all. They say he chase after him and try to run off the laptop. They heard him scream like he screamed that night. Then he'd be gone and there'd be nothing left behind. That's a true story. Maybe it's a story I heard around the fire last time some of us went into the woods for a weekend. My memory ain't been so good recently. It's the cancer. It's a shame because we're going to have to start chemo soon and probably lose all my hair. You have beautiful hair. Can I touch it? No, not in like a weird way. If I just get a wig as soft and bouncy as your hair looks, then I feel at least a little bit better about the whole dying thing. It's a uh, cancer of the wig. Wig cancer. <laughs> They might have to hack it off like scooters. I tell you what, though, honey, it ain't cancer with a dick. Everything looks great down there. <laughs> I wanted to do a whole make-a-wish thing, but they told me it was only for kids. <laughs> I don't want to go to Disneyland or some shit anyways. Just give me a barrel of Jack Daniels and a hose, and my wish could be fulfilled. That or a beautiful woman who, could, uh, who, who I could do whatever I want to. Say, so you wouldn't be willing to help, a di help out a dying man, would you? All right, all right, no need to use harsh language. I suppose I could just ground up a broad down near the crack houses on 5th anyway. Just ain't the same though. Call me old fashioned, but I like a girl with teeth. You sure, <laughs> you sure I can hash something out? I might have a blue that I could throw you away. Sorry. I mean, I mean, you could be though. When I saw you, I thought you might be. No offense. A pretty girl like you, sitting and drinking in a place like this, you'd get any man here at whatever price you wanted. If you did, uh, if you did that at different bars over the week, you could make some good dough. <laughs> All right, all right, you ain't cooking. Don't have to tell a word twice. The dying man can dream, though. You can't hold that against me. But tell me, then, why are you here? You ain't a local girl, and you ain't picking up a man. What's your deal? None of my business, sure. You're pretty frigid now, you know? I'm just trying to make conversation and be friendly, and you're all shut up. It's been a pretty one-sided conversation here. 
I might as well be talking to myself. And if that were the case, at least I know that I have the decency to put out at the end of the goddamn evening. <laughs> yeah, maybe I will do just that. All right, honey. Since you're almost done, I got a question for you. So me and some of the other guys here are waiting for a spot of money and some of the girls that come by. What I want to know is how many abortions have you had? <laughs> I'd say you're maybe a twofer. Well, not somebody that has fucked up your walk yet, but the, but by the way, you're frigid. It tells me that you've at least had one and when you have been in your life for having me do it. Am I close? Don't be shamed, baby. You know, there's this one girl in here who had five. She went home with me and let me do the business. She was a wild woman. Maybe mine was number six. I'll never know. Now, that was just uncalled for. <laughs> I think an honest question deserves an honest answer. A slap in the face and a drink in my lap is not an honest answer. Well, honey, I'll see you in the parking lot in 10. Don't forget all about old Bert, because Bert won't forget about you. Just wait for me, sweetie. Yes, Sal, I would like some paper towels. Another double of whiskey, please. You know, that girl was on fire. I think I'm in love. Cheers to that, buddy. <laughs> turning his thesis in in 12 days. Uh, Breen's guiltiest pleasure is words with friends on his iPhone. And if anyone wants to play, he's being 13. <laughs> Lust is his favorite sin. Aristotle defined it as an excessive love for others. And he's been extremely fortunate to be surrounded by people he loves excessively. If Breen could eat one thing for the rest of his life, like Josh, it would be peanut butter. And you may not know that Breen is growing his mustache in an effort to raise money for cancer research, and that today is his birthday. Oh. Thank you, Nairi. Thank you to a lot of people. This is kind of a end of a little journey, I guess. Um, so this piece is from my novel, and being so, I guess I have to explain a couple things. Um, this part takes place in uh, 2004, and right around Halloween. The narrator is Rooney Martin, and he's a, a wannabe writer from Hawaii, um, the Hawaii, which is the North Shore. Uh, he's in a fiction workshop, and he's currently dreading his work being received. Um, one of the people that have been on is Rooney's roommate in the hotshot freshman point guard, and he varies between adversary and friend for Rooney. Um, Lauren is Rooney's classmate, and maybe Boone's lady to shore. Um, Boone gets around and may or may not have had a romantic encounter with Sharice Roni's workshop here in Crush. Uh, the last detail is that Roni has a wordplay thing that um, he has with his grandfather, and they're called spoonerisms, and they're sort of like the inversion of um, initial consonants. So it's like flakes of snow will turn into like you know, snakes of flow, and popcorn turns into popcorn. So it's, you know. Um, okay, here we go. <laughs> Potato! Boone called. He knew I hated that nickname, but he was smiling like a friend. He stood a head taller than everyone else in the underbelly, our little student hangout. He wore a retro New Orleans jazz basketball jersey, short shorts, Chuck Taylor, stretched out in baggy socks, and a fake mustache with Walt Wandy Lawrence snuggled up next to him. I wasn't even sure what Lauren's costume was, but she had a tiny black pleated skirt, stockings, high heels, and a black bustier and online gloves. Not exactly, not exactly the company I was looking to keep, but they would do until Cherise showed up. The underbelly was decorated with cottony spider webs and jack o' lanterns. The stage had a bale of hay next to fake tombstones and a bloody scarecrow. Michael Jackson's thriller was on repeat. Below the stage sat the cake, and from there Boone continued to wait. I waved back as I crossed the room. Lauren didn't seem to share Boone's same enthusiasm for my presence because I heard her whisper into Boone's chest something like, I thought he said he was a weirdo. <laughs> and Boone whispered that. He is, but he might just be a misunderstood genius. I couldn't help but smile at that remark. I mean, being a misunderstood genius was all that I'd ever wanted to be. Stuck in Waikahana and Kahuku, no one liking me, that meant that I was a misunderstood genius. No friends at Claremont because I was a misunderstood genius. My attraction and obsession to reading sprang from my identification with those who were misunderstood geniuses, caught between worlds belonging to no one. And I wrote for that imaginary community of misunderstood. But there was a part of me that wondered if I ever really wanted to be understood. And then Boone slapped his hand on my shoulder and he asked, You get my costume? I mentioned them to you. Pistol Pete? What are you? 
A guy who turned in his workshop piece and is too nervous to write, Lauren's mouth pinched, trying to conceal a smirk. Boone arched his right eyebrow and he relaxed his mouth, showing his perfect gleaming teeth. Nervous about what? What my classmates, I pointed at Lauren, might think. Lauren enjoyed this. And she didn't even try to conceal her eye or smirk wide now as she said, Serves you right. You treat everyone else's writing like it's total shit. Not everyone's, I said, knowing it had been much kinder to Sharice's work. Yes, everyone. It may have been easier on Sharice, but don't mistake that for going easy. She left the class crying after that comment about how unreliable the narrator was. That was a compliment! I screamed and became woefully self-conscious when the conversation stopped. My desire to remain misunderstood left me. I wanted to fit in. But without Sharice's help, I didn't see how that was possible, and so I said, I'm tired. I think I'm going to bed. Quinn pleaded. Dude, don't go to bed until like four in the morning. I know you're not tired. Maybe I can take... Maybe I just can't take another play of Michael Jackson's Thriller, but I have to leave. And then I walked up the terracotta stairs and back into the Spanish courtyard where, if it weren't for the bump and reverberation of MJ's Halloween epic, no one would have been able to tell that the students were there. I walked down the corridor back to my dorm room with a plan to read since there was no way that I would write a single thing. Remy! I turned and there was Charisse in the courtyard before the underbelly, wearing blue and orange basketball shorts and a white t-shirt and a leather hunting jacket. Her stare drifted, occasionally focusing over my left shoulder. Her curious gaze gave her incredible peripheral vision, which is why she was able to see me, but I yearned for her attention to be on me alone. Molly Mollify, I yelled at her. She beamed at me and said something like, I was so worried that no one would get it. I started to gain back the confidence that I had had the first night we spent together at the underbelly. I replied with certainty, of course I would get that. I was the same age as Molly when I read self evident Mess. I dreamed of her all the time. Her pupils dilated to the point that her eyes looked like shining solar eclipses, the honey of her eyes blinding rain around the obsidian center. She hesitated in the hall for a moment and said, You know, Self Evident Mask came out in 1994, and Molly was 16, pining after Oscar, who was 26, 24 now, so really Molly is 26. You'd be her mom. And I said, But I'm not sure that there's a good alliterative name for Roni. Roni Relief? Maybe Tyrone Temper? Now that makes me sound too angry. Why don't you come down to the underbelly and we'll think of a new name for you? She grabbed my arm and gave it a tight little tug. I don't want to go back down there. Our classmates are in there keep thinking about they run in my story or not. Instead of pulling me back toward the courtyard, she pushed me down the hallway and she said, you don't strike me as the type of guy who would care all that much about what other people think. We walked on the pine tree line, cement pathway to our dorms, and I felt like I had to admit how much what other people think actually matters to me. I care a lot, I told her. They're the first readers, and if the story doesn't resonate with them, then how am I supposed to expect that my story will be accepted by the larger mass of readers? And if I'm also afraid that their comments will influence me too much, and I'll take their advice that and it'll distort my story into something that I never wanted in the first place, something irredeemably worse. She swiped her key card and opened up the front door of the dorm. I couldn't help but wonder where we were headed as we walked into the lobby. The noise of Halloween carousers echoing down the halls, and the smell of cheap beer and expensive weed floated through the air. With students and peers all around, she asked me, then why are you so harsh on everyone else's work if you know how sensitive you are about yours? I spoke softly so that no one overheard. Well, we're all here to improve, allegedly, are we not? <laughs> Sharice nodded and opened the door to the study room on the first floor, which smelled of coffee, overly steeped tea, and almond noodles. There were a few simple pine desks with a green glass lampshade that got really hot. The two couches were upholstered with cheap, hideous cloth. The window into the hallway allowed for the occasional passerby to wave with Cherise. I sat next to her on the couch, and the other the way at the distance. She tucked her legs under her ojole, and her knees pointed at me. She sat only a few feet away. The rest of my arm on the back of the couch pulled up one leg on the seat and angled my body towards her, giving her my full attention. She stared right at me, which didn't happen often. Even in Molly Mall fight costume and University of Virginia basketball shorts, she smelled like vanilla, which reminded me of home because of the similarity in scent of ginger flower that grew over the back of the walls at Uncle Jason's house. But two years after my father's death, Uncle Jason took sole care of me while my mom cared for Snowy at the mental health clinic in Honolulu. Uncle Jason mostly tolerated me, but I remember one time in his backyard with the hibiscus and the ginger growing over the cinder block walls and he let his kukui nut brown eyes lay on me as I told the story about being a forgotten descendant of Queen of New York Honor. And any time I smell ginger or vanilla, it takes me back to that moment when I felt cocooned by that smell and, spe and special for a moment. The smell of ginger was the smell of home and acceptance, but also longing. Shree seemed to expect to say something. 
but I couldn't think of anything other than how beautiful she looked right there, perched on the couch, or how she smells so similarly to home, or if she slept with Boone. But none of those feelings felt like viable options, you know. So I tilted my face and relaxed and pressed my mouth up against her soft, moist lips and stared down at her breasts that heated with her breath and I was connected. At least for the time our lips touched, I didn't feel singular or misunderstood, but unified more than I had at any other moment in literature or watching movies or listening to music. And she kissed me back, her tender lips cupping and sealing our mouths with the lightest flip of the tip of her tongue on my lips. I wanted, I wanted and accepted until she gently laid her palm on my sternum and pushed me back, her eyes honing in on me with a fervor that made me understand why she didn't look at anybody straight on. But then her eyes began to wander again. She pulled up her hand to her mouth and grumbled before saying, I read your story. I honestly didn't care if she read my story at that point. I wanted her eyes back on me. I wanted her to pull her closer and kiss those lips again. But the more I thought about her lips, the more I thought about where her lips had been. Whom or what she had kissed shouldn't have changed anything about that moment on the couch, but I obsessed about it on the same. I thought about not reading it, she continued, and bullshitting through the workshop since you never showed me anything after I told you to send me something. But then I thought, I couldn't help myself. Did you sleep with Boone that night? What does it matter? She leveled out her smile and pulled in her knees to her chest, effectively blocking me from kissing her again. And I wanted to kiss her again. In an attempt to explain myself, I said, Boone's my roommate, and I don't want to be with some hole before halting. Please finish it. Her eyes latched back on me, still transformative feeling, but disarmingly penetrating. Finish it. I stirred the words in my mouth and said, Hum sore, and sang conflating speech that so was. I knew it was wrong as soon as I said it, and yet, she, and yet she immediately left me on the couch in the study, disappearing with one burst of noise from the raucous car years and another three notes from Thriller before the door swung shut and closed me off from the world. But the image in my head of her and Boone together compelled me to act. Once I asked her, though, if she had hooked up with Boone, the image in my mind lost importance and vividness, and I could ignore it, despite her cop out answer. What occupied my mind in the absence now was a complete drought of the workshop now that I lost my only app. Okay, great. So that concludes our uh, student reading portion of the evening. Um, next up, I would like to introduce uh, Sid Field. Sid is the internationally celebrated author of eight books on screenwriting. His classic screenplay, considered the Bible of the film industry, and the screenwriter's workbook are now in their 40th printing, published in 29 languages, and used in more than 400 colleges and universities across the country. His book, The Screenwriter's Problem Solver, has become an int <laughs> That's um, part of the final draft software program. He has taught at USC, UCLA, AFI, Berkeley, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, among others, and by special invitation of the Ministries of Culture, has conducted screenwriting workshops all over the world. In 2001, Field was the first inductee into the Screenwriting Hall of Fame of the American Screenwriting Association, and in 2006, was the recipient of the prestigious Final Draft Hall of Fame Award. His unique iPhone app, which everybody should get, uh, Sid Field's script launcher, was released in spring 2011. Sid's guiltiest pleasure is fresh-baked homemade pizza. Sometimes he has to hide in the shower and eat his pizza so his wife doesn't see. <laughs> uh, chocolate ice cream would be Field's choice if he could eat only one thing for the rest of his life, probably from an Austrian ice cream palace in Vienna called Esselon to Hlaven. Did I get that right? Yes. All right. <laughs> Uh, you may not know that Sid was a member of the NCAA National Championship track team when he ran the 100 meters at USC. Ladies and gentlemen, Sid Field. Well, 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 thank you all for coming. I have to thank Nairi for really organizing this entire evening. And uh, it's just wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm going to read from uh, one of my books called Going to the Movies, and um, I have to give you a little backstory to, uh, to the, what I'm going to read. Uh, when I went to Berkeley uh, at one time, uh, I was uh, an actor, and I wor had the great fortune of working with Jean Renoir, the great French film director, and he's the one who really got me into film. Um, 
when I was there, I got the third lead in a, thank you, in the world premiere of his play Corolla. And the woman who played Corolla at Berkeley was a woman by the name of Deneen Peckinpah. And I was in a relationship with Deneen's roommate, so we became fairly close, and then we both read for the play, and then we got both cast in the play. And we spent an extraordinary eight months working at the knees of this great French film director, Jean Renoir, whose father was the great painter, Pierre-Auguste Renoir. So, Deneen and I had been together for a while. When I left Berkeley, I got a job at Wolper Productions, which was a documentary film uh, company. And um, the chapter I'm going to read, or the portion of the chapter I'm going to read, is called In Search of New Beginnings. On a bright sunny day in May 1966, after more than four and a half years in which I participated in the making of more than 125 television documentaries, I decided to leave the safe haven of Wolper Productions. I had received an incredible education, worked with some of the finest talents in the film industry, and climbed several rungs up the corporate ladder of success. But it was time to move on. To what? I didn't know. I had left Wolper because I was beginning to feel like I was in a rut. During the time I was there, I had written film pieces for the magazine Film Quarterly, al along with several book reviews for the LA Times. But I could feel the forces of change the rebellion happening all around me, in music and in film, and I wanted to be a part of that. The more I thought about it, the more I understood that I really wanted to write screenplays. Not the normal fluff like the Rock Hudson and Doris Day pillow talk movies that were being made at the time, but screenplays that focused on ideas that I was passionate about. Screenplays that dealt with real people in real situations. I wanted to write scripts that were strong and powerful, that captured the spirit of the artistic and political rebellion spreading across the land. I also knew that I had to stay alive while I waited for that spark of inspiration. I had to pay the rent, of course. I started taking freelance assignments, writing proposals, stories, or treatments for movies and TV shows. I wrote on-camera openings for a TV series called The Westerner, wrote a feature-length documentary, Spree, wrote stories for TV shows like The Man from U.N.C.L.E., Amos Burke, Secret Agent, and Batman, spent a miserable three months in Ethiopia writing and directing a documentary and returned home with a dislocated left shoulder, suffered in a fight with my cameraman. <laughs> Even though I was freelancing, my intention was still the same. I wanted to write original screenplays, but I had no idea of what to do or how to go about doing it. All the years I spent at Wolper had trained me to approach a show that already had a subject. I learned very quickly it was a lot easier having a subject like John Wayne or Humphrey Bogart than creating a storyline out of thin air. I knew that in order to write a screenplay, I had to have a story. And that meant I had to have a subject to write about. So what kind of screenplay was I going to write? Western? Romance? Thriller? Action-adventure? Detective story? I knew I was attracted to some kind of contemporary theme, but in truth, I had no idea what I was looking for. But fate sometimes works in mysterious ways. A few months after I left Wolper, I received a call from the editor of Film Quarterly asking me to write a movie review of a film called Lonely Are the Brave, written by the great Dalton Trumbo, produced by and starring Kurt Douglas. The film was a modern-day Western, both in terms of execution and presentation. The story about a modern cowboy who breaks into jail to see a friend, only to break out again and find himself being hunted down by the forces of society, is a strong and sympathetic statement on the high price of freedom. Trumbo's screenplay depicts a man who stands outside the reach of society's convention a man who makes his own rules according to his own moral code. The theme of an individual refusing to bend to the conventions of society 
strongly appealed to me. Besides, I liked the movie. I thought it would be fun to write about it. As I was writing my piece on Lonely Are the Brave, I got another call from the editor of Film Quarterly asking me to see a, a film called Ride the High Country. He wondered whether I might be able to compare the two films in terms of style, execution, and theme. Ride the High Country was written and directed by Sam Peckinpah. It had been released to very good reviews and then had simply disappeared from sight. So I finally found a small rundown theater out in the suburbs, and I was one of the very few people in the audience. But as soon as the film began, I was hooked. It had a strong subject and a great style, and was done with such color and humor that I was totally taken in by it. As I was driving home, I suddenly knew that if I could write a screenplay like that, I would be satisfied. I compared the themes and style of the two movies from my review and began to seriously consider considering writing a Western as my first screenplay. The more I thought about it, the more attracted I was to the idea. I liked the genre, and from my research at Wolper, I knew there were certain time periods, like the turn of the century, or immediately following the Civil War, that provided good dramatic situations paralleling the spirit of rebellion that was now sweeping across the land. All I had to do was find a story. So I could mold that and fashion that into a screenplay. I started hanging out at the library, reading about the West in newspapers and books and personal diaries. The aftermath of the Civil War I saw provided a very strong dramatic backdrop. The idealistic conflict between North and South, between one way of life and another, often pitted brother against brother, friend against friend. It had potential for strong action, dynamic and colorful characters who would lay down their lives for their own personal freedom. I found the same kind of moral dilemma existed during the period right after the Civil War. When the war ended in 1865, it left its people in, in a state of dissatisfaction and disillusion. They were restrained by new rules and a new way of life. The men who once wore the Confederate Union with pride and dignity were now forced to sign loyalty oaths to the North, something they had so fought so hard against. It was a time of revolt. Those who refused to sign loyalty oaths or give up their guns as the law required became outlaws. So even though the Civil War was over and a treaty signed, it didn't change people's beliefs. Their loyalty was intact either to the South or the North. And this is the period of the mythic Old West as we know it from the movies, when the outlaw gangs of Jesse James and Billy the Kid and the Younger Brothers rode the range. This era provided a, a fertile story ground that reflected the social unrest and rebellion of modern times. After all, it was the mid-60s. And when I walked down Sunset Boulevard at night to the pulsating energy of music was hovering on the night wind, the songs of Bob Dylan and the Beatles were everywhere. And yes, the times, they were changing. It was the L.A. scene and a great place to be. Looking back, I see that when I was writing that article on Lonely Are the Brave and Ride the High Country, I was really learning the craft of writing a screenplay. What I had only intuited as a vague idea about screenwriting suddenly started getting clearer, like cleaning a thin layer of dust off a mirror and exposing the reflection of what lay beneath. A few days after I turned in my piece to film quarterly, I got a phone call from Denise Peckinpah. She was in LA, she said, to pursue an acting career. I hadn't seen her for several years, not since we had acted together in Renoir's Corolla at Berkeley. When we got together for lunch a few days later, I casually asked if she was in a relation to Sam. She laughed and she said, yes, Sam was her uncle. And she was staying at his house in Malibu. When I told her how much I liked to ride the high country and how I wanted to write screenplays like that, she smiled and said Sam would like to hear that. A few nights later, she invited me over for dinner. 
I had heard lots of stories about Sam, of course, about his drunken antics, the difficulties he had on the set with crew, his sense of perfectionism, the conflicts he had with the studios and producers. So I really didn't know what to expect when I met him in person. But as we sat down for dinner, I found he reminded me a little of my Uncle Saul, tough and honest with a keen sensibility and understanding. He wasn't drinking the hard stuff, he said, only two beers a day. And during our conversation, I learned he had not made a film since Major Dundee some four years earlier. Dundee had been made right after Ride the Hot Country, and it had been a traumatic experience for him. In his words, a personal disaster. It was while working on Dundee that he got the reputation of being difficult meaning unemployable in the Hollywood vernacular. He couldn't get any work after that and was only now being given a chance to rewrite and direct a new screenplay called The Wild Bunch. There were so many questions I wanted to ask him about writing. I wanted to know how he created his characters, what he looked for when he was searching for a subject or a story, if he artificially created the story's conflict or if it was inherent in the story. The list went on and on, but I wanted to be cool, so I asked him only a few questions at the time. Sam was open, receptive, and seemed to enjoy our conversation. Late one afternoon, after Sam had finished his writing on The Wild Bunch, I asked him how he structured his stories. He paused for a long moment, took a sip of beer, and then told me he liked to hang his stories around a centerpiece. Typically, he said, he would build the action up to a certain event about midway through the story and then let everything else be the result of that event. When I thought about the story, Ride the High Country, I saw that this centerpiece was the wedding scene that took place in the brothel. Once he had set up the story and characters, everything, all the action led to that one wedding sequence. And then the, the rest of the movie was a result of that sequence. To build a dramatic storyline I saw, I could hang the story around this centerpiece event. We discussed it for a while, and then he left the room and returned a few minutes later, holding a script. It was the screenplay for Major Dundee. Take a look at it, he urged. I read it that night, and reading this screenplay was an absolute revelation. As I sit writing this, I think that if there is any one screenplay that taught me more about the art and the craft of screenwriting, it was his script, Major Dundee. The story takes place right after the Civil War. Like the John Wayne character in The Searchers, Dundee is on the relentless quest to track down some renegade Apaches responsible for the massacre that opens the story and to rescue the hostage children. Dundee doesn't care how he does it or what price he flicks upon others to achieve this goal. Major Dundee opens with a Halloween party at an isolated ranch on the western frontier just before the end of the Civil War. Music is playing, people are dancing, laughing, having a good time, while costumed children run around outside playing games. Then Sam cuts from the painted face of a child playing cowboys and Indians to the face of an Apache brave painted for war. Amid the music and dance, as children giggle and scream in joy and mock fright, the Apaches launch their attack, killing everyone and everything except the male children and the horses. How did Peckinpah achieve such a marvelous balance of tension and color and humor? That's what I wanted to explore. Peckinpah describes Dundee as a sculpture of battle. And as far as I was concerned, Peck and Paul was a sculpture of film. I saw how he created the wonderful shadings and personal histories that add so much flavor to characters. I studied one sequence in particular over and over and over again because it really seemed to embody Peck and Paul's personal style. 
not only is it the centerpiece of the film, but this one sequence was like an education in itself. On the trail of the renegade Apaches, the makeshift unit is camped for the night. The sequence opens with a bugler writing in his journal, and we hear him in a voiceover talking about the quiet and peacefulness of the trek. But in reality, he's surrounded by a flurry of activity and commotion. Pots and pans are flying as one-armed Indian scout and Apache scout engage in a wrestling match. Suddenly, the call of a wild animal, and instantaneously, all sound stops. There is total silence. Then, emerging out of the darkness, we see an old Apache. Straggling behind him are the hostage children Dundee has been seeking. The old man explains that the Apache chief, Chiriba, has told him he's too old to ride with the renegades and has sent him to the white man. He gives the message to Dundee, who is dressed only in boots and underwear, another peck and claw touch, and informs the major that he will lead him to the Apache's camp. Now, everybody knows the mission of the old man is to set the company up for an Apache ambush, but after a heated discussion, Dundee decides to follow him anyway. When they reach the river separating the U.S. and Mexico, Dundee moves upriver to another location and crosses there. And it's here that they're ambushed. At the end of the sequence, most of the Dundee's troops are, wi are wiped out, the survivors are wounded, and their horses are gone. Only some mules remain. At the end of the sequence, they mount up, ready to leave the site of this massacre. And here's where Peck and Paul breaks the mood with a humorous episode that relieves the violence and tension we've just witnessed. As the straggly bunch mount, Dundee climbs on his mule and gives the command to move out. But the mule doesn't listen. He simply stands and then nonchalantly begins nibbling on the grass while the column drifts to a halt, forming a circle around Dundee. Dundee prods and kicks the animal to no avail. And then Dundee orders two troopers to stand in front of and behind the mule. Push and pull, he orders. They move into position and start pushing and pulling. And suddenly, the animal gives a great kick, sending the men sprawling and still the mule refuses to move forward. In rage, Dundee twists the animal head and starts yelling at him eyeball to eyeball. Finally, the mule responds, leaping into the air like a rocket, bucking, kicking, twisting, turning, churning, whirling, twirling through the troops, the brush, through anything and everything. The ornery mule bangs against trees, stands on its back feet, stands on its front feet, stands on its nose. Dundee holds, kicking the animal with all his strength. And then suddenly, in slow motion, Dundee rises into the air, floats through the air, and then hits the ground with a tremendous impact. Around him, Dundee's troops laugh so hard they almost fall off their horses. The entire scene is done without a single sound in total silence. Slowly, Dundee gets up, dusts himself off, daring anyone to laugh, and remounts the mule. Ho, he says, and gallantly leads the troops forward. I just love that sequence. After all the bloodshed and carnage Dundee and his men have gone through, I found myself laughing out loud marveling at how Peckinpah manages to break the entire mood of the film in a single stroke. More important, this event unifies the men as a dedicated unit, able to leave their personal differences and political conflicts behind. It's an extraordinary moment that brings life and dimension and humor to an otherwise grim event. I still marvel at the writing, the visual execution, the dramatic value, and the sympathetic response. The more I thought about this particular moment, the more I began to understand one of the rules of dramatic writing. 
A tense, suspenseful moment can be followed by a humorous episode in order to break the tension. Shakespeare does this in Macbeth, in the famous knocking at the gate scene. After the emotionally charged murder of the king, Shakespeare cuts to Macduff knocking at the front gate, while the drunken gatekeeper waxes eloquently about how the evils of alcohol create the desire to take away the ability. <laughs> it's called comic relief. Today I share this dramatic insight with my screenwriting students around the world, and I show them how a dramatic scene will often be followed by a broad, humorous comedy. It's a way of opening up and expanding the storyline, giving it more depth and dimension, more character. The next time I went by Sam's house, I told him how much I loved the script. We talked about writing screenplays for many hours after that, and he spoke about what he wanted to do with the Wild Bunch. Toward the end of the summer, inspired by Sam, I woke up feeling that maybe it was time for me to take the plunge and start writing my own screenplay. I had just made the decision when the phone rang. It was Denise. Sam had just finished his draft of The Wild Bunch and asked if I would read it.